Welcome to Botez in Business. It's our 50th episode, and with that, we're very grateful. And that's the theme of today's show. We're going to have Michael Ian Cedar on about why happiness isn't a choice. He's the host of the Gratitude Slam on Facebook. It's a free Facebook group. It's a daily reminder to discipline yourself and focus on the positive side of life and have a positive attitude. Michael's an executive leadership coach. He's a skilled facilitator and a keynote speaker. He has 20 years experience helping clients bring their professional and personal lives into alignment, combining a high energy passion with non-judgmental approach. I'll tell you, this is one of those conversations that when I was in it just really clicked. I am super excited for this episode. And the truth is I moved a bunch of stuff around to pull it up and make it part of our celebration. That's how grateful I am for having had this conversation. Michael helps his clients tap into their potential and lead others by focusing on their emotional intelligence, interpersonal relations, and management skills. He works with people at all stages of their career. He's got an amazing background in producing events throughout the country as a traveling show manager with theater productions and dance competitions. He works with some entertainment types and Wall Street people really high powerful high earners and helps them find their way in happiness and what they do speaking of which every week salespeople and their managers and business owners they all stare at their crm system they hope they know what's going on in their must win game changing deals you know the ones the ones that keep the lights on myself and my partner david developed the red zone sales opportunity management app it's helped me transform several businesses that i've run by increasing revenue and driving incremental gross margins. We'd like you to learn about it. So if you take a minute and go to timkubiak.com slash red zone, check out and get to know red zone. And if you are interested in buying it, use the discount code bow ties at checkout for 20% off. With that, we're back to talking about Michael and the gratitude slam. Again, it's a Facebook group. He has a live session at 801 every Tuesday morning and I really enjoy it myself. This is one of those ones that, you know, I love all the people I talk to on the show, but this again is one of the people and one of the conversations that made a difference for me. All right, we're good to go. So Michael, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm a leadership and life coach, and I run a group on Facebook called The Gratitude Slam, which sounds uh, super like, whoa, that sounds like not for me maybe, but what it's about is being able to, f- I help people focus on uh, reality, what is in the present right now, because it's the only place we have to go from. Uh, prior to that, I, um, I mean, I started when I was as a teenager as a uh, bar mitzvah and wedding MC, and I did that for 13 years. Then I moved into managing uh, Broadway tours around the country, bus and truck tours around the country. Then I went into producing um, dance events in 70 cities around the country every single year, hosting 40,000 performers. And it sounds like my resume is all over the place, and it is on paper, but if you actually look at it all, there's everything has one thing in common. And that's, I really like creating environments for people to be uninhibited to learn about themselves uh so as far as i'm concerned even when i was um doing you know bar mitzvah and wedding emceeing those were my original days of coaching it was just coaching by creating an environment where people can you know not feel scared to be themselves and that's exactly the work i do now so what's the greatest story about you have pulling somebody onto the dance floor Oh, pulling somebody on the dance floor. I don't know. The most immediate thing that comes to mind is uh, there was one event. It was Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, and I, there, I knew there was something different about the gig. The, the parents were a little like, yeah, just, just show up. It, it'll be fine. And I showed up and I don't know what it was. And I did hundreds up to that point. There were literally, if you can remember the scene from Gremlins, like where they're like in the movie theater and they're hanging from the chandelier and they're in the, like, it was like that. Like there was no control. It's like, 
they didn't want me to know <laughs> what this party was probably going to be like. And it was my worst possible day as a, as a, in that field. Uh, but the client was happy <laughs> because I think we just kept their, their, their little, uh, you know, their little DNA buddies busy the entire time. Um, <laughs> the house didn't get flattened in other words, or, well, the, or the venue. <laughs> well, the next month that venue closed and I go, wow, we did some damage there, didn't we? Yeah. And and though you know what, Tim, I still look back at that and go, like to this day. I mean, that was we're talking thirty years ago, maybe no, maybe twenty five years ago, right? I look back at that and I go, what? How could have I facilitated that differently? Right? Still to this day, I look back at that and I go. Man, where can I have taken better responsibility for how that went? Even though the client was happy, I was like, I, I but it wasn't, it wasn't the outcome I would have desired, you know? Yeah. A little more punk rock than bar mitzvah, right? <laughs> yeah. Anarchist, I'd say more. Yeah. See? Yeah. yeah. That sounds like my youth, actually. So, <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, because you you like metal, right? Yeah. I, I yeah. grew up in metal and punk clubs, played in, I started playing in, bands when i was 14 with adults so literally had my dad would drive me to shows and i'd play in places no 14 year old should be <laughs> so i love that here you are wearing a bow tie but knowing you've you've uh come from the underground uh, you know metal scene up exactly. there. but do you still like metal i do i still listen to metal i listen to a lot of european techno and yeah. pretty much anything anything with an edge i'm a hardcore motor head guy as well so oh neat yeah when i um when i'm feeling low energy i will totally put on some european techno and it bothers the heck out of me but man does it make my it, my pupils dilate <laughs> yeah you know what one of my bucket list things pre-pandemic was actually the electric daisy festival in vegas if you know what that is i don't know it no so it's basically a three or four day thing at the las vegas motor speedway it's a 24 hour essentially legal rave and i <laughs> i was I leaving that. vegas about three years ago and everybody was coming in for it so i'm like yep i gotta do this i'm too old i'll disappear by 10 okay. p.m pacific but I, i've got to see it so post pandemic we're gonna you know hey i'm going you're welcome go to it. join <laughs> but, yeah, i always like trying things i've i've never done in fact one of the things i did was i i'm known for it, so i you know uh, uh i i'm super fortunate to have an amazing wife her name is lauren and she's super supportive of my growth and my business and instead of being like can you just get a normal job you know she totally supports us and so one of the things that she's that i just love she's supportive of us is i love doing um solar retreats like at the beginning of the year before the pandemic hit i took myself on a week-long cruise just to be with my thoughts just to think about like the work i want to be doing and how i want to show up for the world right and um are you there you look frozen yeah i i don't know what happened so okay, but we're here audio -wise. we're here audio so just That's, keep rolling we'll we're clean it up rolling. so uh one of the things i did uh is i took myself to you know i'm here in new york city and not too far away is Bucks, Pen Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And it's an interesting place. And I took myself on a multi-day little just um, thinking retreat there to, to gather my thoughts. And um, they had a metal concert uh, that was going on one of the nights I was there. And I've never really listened to metal on my own. And I went and I sat and I was like, oh. I get it. I feel alive right now. Cause I just was like, let me do something out of my comfort zone. And going there was totally out of my zone. Like I, you know, and, and uh, you know, I was dressed up in like a button down shirt, you know, and, and I walked in, people thought I was the waiter. <laughs> and nice. someone actually ordered a drink with me. I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen to the music. Like, Oh, so sorry. You know, but I just sat there and was like, I feel alive, right? And so cool. And I would have never done that if I wasn't like, if I was like, no, nah, that's not my what I do, you know? Yeah, no, and I agree. You got to try new things. And I love the solo retreat idea, right? Oh, it is. I'd say when I started doing that, my business took off. 
It just did. You know, I call them man cave retreats, you know, but it, you don't have to be a man to take one. It could be a woe man, you know, cave retreat or whatever you want to name it. But I just, I really believe that um, the work I do is very conscious work, right? It's very being in the present work. And um, I really, in order to connect to that, I just need to be alone sometimes. And, and it's funny because I'm an extrovert. I love people. I love talking. I love, but I've got to just be able to sit with my thoughts and just go, I have no agenda right now. Just let me be. And, and, and let me read some old journals and diaries, or let me read, um, some books that are on a topic that's important to me, not about the business itself. And then I, then, and so literally this is, now that I'm saying it loud, I do have a formula for them and I've done many of them now over the past probably five or six years. Um, the first half of whatever I do is no agenda of business, just absorbing and, and trying to absorb things I normally would absorb like metal music. And then the second half is, what do I want to give my, my energies to over the next year of time? And, and I just found it's a beautiful formula. Um, I've made a lot of positive pivots that I probably would have been stuck on the wrong goal too long if I didn't give myself that time. Because otherwise, it's busy, 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 busy. So I, I just, it's, it's one of my favorite times in the and again, having a, uh, a partner or wife that's like, yeah, do it. And guess what? She does them too. She does them with a very different, she does them to go for the flow of things, to, to be able to go shopping alone. Like one day I wake up, literally, this is, this is so funny. This is one of my favorite stories of Lauren. One day I wake up and I'm like, hey, going into the shower. She goes, hey, um, great. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about booking a trip to London. I go, oh, no, no, no. That's not what she said. She wakes up. I wake up. I go, hey, going in the shower. She goes, great. Hey, I think I want to go shopping this weekend. Like just no agenda shopping. I said, okay. Come out of the shower. She goes, booked it. I go, booked what? She goes, booked a ticket to London. I go, you booked a ticket to London for this weekend? Are you going with anyone? She's like, no, just me. And 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 she and and I don't know if she got that from me. I mean, you know, she I was doing those solar retreats first, and she's like, and she was supposed to do one now uh, in the summertime, but of course the pandemic happened. Uh, but she loved it. She loved it, and um, I love that she did it. And we can be supportive of one another doing those kinds of things, and we get to come back to one another stronger and more connected to ourselves, which allows for a really powerful interdependent relationship. That's amazing, and I, I have to ask. What was she shopping for in London? You know, so many people, that's generally people's first question. It's like, oh, she must be looking for, uh, you know, beautiful, you know, things that we can't import here. I don't think any, she brought back a lot of stuff. I don't think anything she brought back was over 20 US dollars. She just likes the experience of going to stores that are not here and touching the merchandise and trying it on if it's clothing or, and I, I say she even brought back more tchotchkes than anything. I mean, we are very big tea. So you're with bow ties. Here's my cup of tea right here. I even have a thermos of tea over here. I have a hole in my office here in Midtown. I just had a client come over and what we do is we make really nice imported teas and sit there and have tea together and talk about these massive business moves to make right and and so um london's known for their tea right and so you know, we, you know she won't stop buying tea um but she brought back a lot of tea so i'd i'd say if anything she brought back a massive amount of english tea you know what that's never a bad thing i'll drink oh. tea I'm, I'm primarily a coffee guy but good english tea that'll get you a long way in life <laughs> absolutely absolutely just fun it's cool. You know what I like about tea? It's cozy. And right, my style, even my coaching style, it's cozy, right? Again, couches and tea and, you know, and it's in Midtown, New York on 42nd and 5th, you people come in and they go, whoa, not what I was expecting a look wise. It's like a living room here almost. Is that in, on 42nd and 5th, that is a different look, right? There's it's, a it's, it creates this dichotomy, right? It's, yeah. it's these two worlds in one. And so, and the reason I did that intentionally, because I don't have to have an office for coaching, right? Right. Like, I don't, I might be the only coach in my circle I know that has a separate 
city office space. I know there's others that have it, but I, I don't know many people have it, but it was a choice that I decided to make because I was like, I, it's important that I get people out of their environment. Going back to this idea of these solo treats, right? Going to the mouth thing. I've got, in order for me to grow, I've got to do something I'm not used to doing. And so people coming into this environment that is 50% office and 50% living room automatically pulls people out of their, um, their norms because I'm coaching high performing seven figure and high six earners executives. And so they're generally used to a different environment. And um, here I am wearing my, you know, Puma sneakers and they're coming in and their company sending them in and like wearing suit and ties. I'm like, Hey, welcome, man. <laughs> you know, and so so I'll automatically I'm creating this um, dichotomy for them where there's just enough comfort and just enough. Okay. This is not what I'm used to bet. And, you know, works for the, their energy differently, right? It, 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 well, yeah, it changes the focus, which changes the energy, which changes the attitude, which changes the openness, right? It's like all things, all things thrown off, you know, it's like equilibrium gets thrown off. And, and I believe that discomfort creates growth and pain creates change. And my promise to my clients is from day number one is no one will make you more uncomfortable than me, but I will never push you to a point of pain. And so I just create, you know, my goal is to create just enough discomfort um, in the coaching, not necessarily the space. Like I'm not having them sit like, you know, on a wooden uncomfortable chair, uh, just enough dichotomy, just enough duality, just enough. I've not prodded in this area. That's like, Oh, that hurts. I'm like, okay, well let's go down that road then. But I will not put them to a place, right? I don't, I'm not a therapist. I'm not here to dwell up the old healing, you know, old, old, old past wounds, right? Therapy is about the past and healing and coaching is about I'm here. I want to get somewhere else in the future. I'm just like, Hey, where are we right now? How are we going to get to the future? And, 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 and we got to figure out where the discomfort is in order to move faster. So part of what you do is really help people understand how their identity is wrapped up in their jobs. Is that a fair statement? Oh yeah. That is such a big part of, of, of my work is, you know, again, here in, uh, so I, I grew up in New Jersey, which is basically a, a foreign suburb of New York. But growing up that close to the city and spending basically from my 20s, uh, from, uh, from being 20 years old up in New York City or traveling on a bus, it's a very career-centric world here, right? And, and I've um, spent a lot of time in, the, in, the, in other parts of the country. I mean, I, I've actually worked in 49 of the 50 states, interesting fact. I just have to work in Hawaii to say I've worked in all 50 states. And, um, and, and I, you know, I was a little um, blinded by not all parts of our um, culture are as career-driven as the area I grew up in right? And that's not good nor bad. Like, hey, rock on. If anything, it's a little bit on the bad side, like being career driven. And so I'm so used to, and, and, and generally, obviously, if you're a high performer, you've put a lot of stock and energy and investment into your career. And, you know, probably you've made some sacrifices or compromises in your life, possibly. I'm not saying that's a definite. And so what I find a lot is, is and I'm finding this a lot now during the pandemic, right? And so this is during the time of COVID-19 in 2020. And a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of super powerful people lost their jobs because they just don't exist. Their industries don't exist. And if they didn't lose their job, the job doesn't have the same meaning and depth that it has, at least right now. Right. And, and there's some industries that might just never come back the same way again. I, my background is entertainment, as I said, high end uh, editorial entertainment. It's an industry. I just don't know if it'll ever rebound the same way. Point is, is I've, I just encounter so many people in my personal life and of course my professional life who go, well, who am I without my job? And, and it's just really a super, sensitive topic right now because a lot of people are going well who am i do i add value when i'm not doing what i do 
And, and so what a neat question to go when I'm not coaching, who am I? When you're not doing a podcast, who am I? When I'm not, and you're a sales coach, right? And so, and I'm not coaching sales. If I can't coach sales, where's my value, right? If I can't be a general manager for the world's largest Broadway show, what power do I have? Do I have power, right? When I am not, um, you know, doing whatever that is. And, and so, and I dealt with this, by the way, I, I mean, I was, I mean, the reason I can coach, right. You spot it, you got it, right. It's a very AA kind of term, right. You spot it, you got it, man. I think what, you know, I, I, I don't, I can't say I'm a good coach or not. Right. I guess that's to the people who get the coaching, but I'd, I'd like to think I'm a pretty dialed in coach. I feel dialed in. And I think the reason I can dial in really quickly is because I used to work 20, literally when I'm saying these numbers, these are not false numbers. Average of 20 hours a day, seven days a week, 364 at least days out of the year. I probably took a day off somewhere. Um, Would go to the bed, go to the bathroom with the, you know, the portable cell phone, portable phone with the long antennas on it, having fun. Like I would feel guilty not doing work, you know, and, and then, and then like, man, if the, if, if my work was on the line, I would panic because who am I without it? So man, if, if, if anyone can talk to it, it's man, I, I was there and I ruined my health. I ruined my relationships. I ruined a first marriage. I ruined every, I mean, just name it. I screwed it up. I mean, take the worst metal song you have. Have, that's probably what I was like, you know. That was me inside. You, you know? went country western. It was so bad. Country western rock metal. Yeah, there was. <laughs> yeah, it was bad fusion, and it went expired, <laughs> and you know, and it was like made in somebody's garage pre Steve Jobs Apple computers. You know, and so, so I empathize really, really deeply with people who identify with their who who put their value and worth in what they do. Right. And then there's some people who go, who am I if I don't make a million dollars this year? And, and I mean, man, how many stories, oh man, there's a great story and I can't think of it. I'll swing back around with it when it comes into my mind, but there's a lot of stories of people coming in second in their industries super high craft, super high, half a million, you know, I'm sorry, uh, a half a billion dollars revenue and they commit suicide because they weren't number one. I mean, the amount of stories that are told yeah. like that, that are real, not fables are, are saddening, you know, and, 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 and so I, uh, my goal in life is to get to people sooner and faster. And I want to be, look, I love business. I love being a high performer. I love achievement. I love all of it, but, but I, but I, I once did type my value as a human into that and that broke. And so you want to, so, so, that, so anyways, I hope I answered your question on that is my point. <laughs> you did. So let's talk about the journey you see with your clients a little bit, right? Yeah. So you've been there. I've been, I've been the train wreck, right? Tanked like a rock star myself. Um, how do people come from that place where they are their careers to finding out maybe who they really are beyond that? Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be super academic with this answer, right? Because there's my, wow, this is a hard one to put into words. And then there's the, you know, man, I can't sit in front of a high performing executive and just talk about like, okay, what's your what's your life's purpose, right? And so I have to right. come to the table with some tangibility. So I'm going to go super academic on this. And, and I just, there's been yet a time where this model did not create a massive move of the, the, the needle for them. And so I go from the standpoint of, I go, hey, let's, and, and I don't necessarily do this with everyone, right? It depends what individuals are coming to me for. But if someone's coming to me and they're just like, lost my job, really having dark thoughts right now or, or about to lose my job. And I don't, I just don't think I have what it takes to get it, you know, to get back in good standing or whatever it is. If people's values are attached to their, their worth is attaching to something else. And even if they're not in scared fear of losing something, people who are workaholics, I actually, I'll tell this story and then I'm going to come back to it. So one of my favorite moments in coaching history in my life is I had a super great human being um, come to me, or was assigned to me, actually. 
they were assigned to me by their HR department. They were working around the clock, you know, um, the, if I mentioned the product name, you would know what it is, you know, and they're, they're a super high end um, provider for that brand. And the very first meeting, the chemistry meeting, right? The chemistry meeting to just be like, hey, we're pairing you. Just make sure that you guys are a good match. And I just remember we were over video and he looks down. At, he starts by looking down at the table, look at body language is slumped. And, and he just said, hi, my name is blank and uh, this is my job here i was like i know who you are i know what your job is there most of the world knows your job as well um and who you are and he is i'm thinking that and he just goes the first thing out of his mouth after saying his name and title right but immediately stock is and this is me this is my job he looks up at the camera and he goes i dropped my 10 year old daughter off at school today and i drove away and I realized I have no idea what color dress she was wearing. Can you help me? Wow. Yeah, right? Super, super wow. And I mean, I got the chills and I don't have children, so I don't know what that would be like, but I, I just said, yeah, yeah, I've been there. I can help, you know, maybe I don't have the daughter, but I remember not knowing if I talked to my mom that day, you know? So yeah, let's do this. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, great. Right. And, and so there are stories like that, that, I mean, how many of us have that where we forget what it's like to be present with the people we love, you know, and talk about gratitude, right? The gratitude, yeah. being great of gra being great of grateful, being grateful of grateful for what you do have now, because as COVID has definitely taught us, you could lose a lot real fast, you know? Uh, and I believe there's only, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, by the way. Oh, you're uh, good. We're, we're coming, we're coming full circle, right? There's only one thing we can control. And that's it. And, and man, one of my favorite books is uh, Ishmael by Dennis Quinn. But the theme of the book is basically the only thing you can control. Control is an illusion. The only thing you can control is your response to everything happening. You could lose your job. You could lose a limb. You could lose a loved one. You could lose a spouse, a partner, a lover, right? And I can't control that, you know? I can only control how I show up in that moment. And so let's go back to your question uh, or, or let's go back to that academic thing that I do when people are wrapped up in their jobs so much that they, let's use that analogy, don't know the color of their daughter's dress, right? And, and they want to be a good dad or, or a good mom, right? Uh, or a good family member, whatever. And so one of the first things I do is go, hey, let's, let's talk about what you do. Like, hey, well, who are you? What do you do? And people generally go, oh, I'm a, I'm a designer. I'm a actor. I'm a Broadway star or whatever, you know? And I'll go, okay, so what vehicles do you have in your life? How do you deliver yourself? How do you show up? And I'll give the example. So vehicles in my life in the past and current were bringing a full circle, bar mitzvah and wedding MC. That was a vehicle. Uh, being a company manager for Broadway bus and truck tours. That's how I worked in 49 of the 50 states. Um, coach, right? But then I'm also a husband. That's how I deliver my self. That is a vehicle. Being a husband's a vehicle. I am here as a vehicle to serve our relationship. Being a son. Mm -hmm, right? Um, these are ways I, these are titles, they're labels. That's all they are. Take away the word husband. What am I to my wife, right? How do you like total? That's why I said there's some intangible parts here. But if we actually take the word husband away, who am I to my wife? That's the first time I've actually said it like that. That's pretty badass if you ask me. That's pretty good. Who am I to my wife if we don't call me a husband, right? What a neat, right? Oh, crap. Taking, who am I without the ring on? I'm putting my ring back on. All right. So, <laughs> so those are vehicles. And so people challenge, well, I'm a, I, you know, uh, you know, and, and that's hard, for a lot of people that's hard to do is to come up with the vehicles. It's like, well, well, being a, being a 
uh, you know, volunteer for the first day. That's not a vehicle. That's a purpose. Nah, dude, that's a way you show up in physical form. In physical form, it, you have to show up as a vehicle in physical form, and we are in human form, okay? I don't care what your background is and anyone's background is in faith. We are in physical form if we're talking, you know? And if we're not, please tell me because I need to learn from you uh, a lot. So those are vehicles. And after we go over the vehicles, I then go, great, what are you passionate about? Oh, I'm passionate about working. I'm passionate about money. I'm passionate about, you know, being top of my industry, being number one, right? And so I hear a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm not going to take that away from them. Okay, what else are we passionate about, right? Oh, well, I'm passionate about my family. I'm passionate about... And so we just ask these questions, not for any other purpose other than going, separating, all right, your passion is not your vehicle. So for me, right, we talked about it. My passion's tea. I don't make money off of tea. I incorporate it in a way I make money, but I'm also passionate about the TV show West Wing. I don't even, I'm not even a big political guy. I could talk about, I've got the whole series right here on DVD. I don't even own a DVD player anymore, but I don't make any money off of West Wing. Never will probably. If I do, cool, that was a neat path, but I'm passionate about it. Right? I'm passionate about um, women's rights. I'm very passionate. And it doesn't mean I'm not, I don't care about other rights, but I'm very passionate for different reasons in my upbringing about women's rights, right? The charity I, I donate to is called She's the First. It gets girls in first world country, uh, third world countries, excuse me, to be the first in their entire lineage, to be the first ever to go to high school by either supplying the funds to get them out of the country so they can learn or to build a school in their country, right? And so I'm saying that not to be like, oh, how altruistic, but I'm saying it, I'm super passionate about it that I find vehicles that I could that I could use it in. But I don't always make money or show up in the vehicles. You know, I guess you could say the vehicle of being a tea drinker, but you know, it but that is a vehicle, I guess, to share tea. You know, hey, how do how do I show up? I serve tea. So when I have, then all of a sudden there's this difference of, okay, what I'm passionate about is not necessarily my job. And what a lot of people learn already at this point is, and I'm just using the acting world as an example because it's a perfect example. Oh, you know what? I was passionate about theater and I turned it into a job and that's why I'm not happy anymore. So already a lot of people start going, oh, I was passionate about making video games now oh wait a second and now it's a vehicle i just liked it when it was a passion and so already there's that separation right so now we're starting to sort of um move the fascia away from the muscle and the skins right you know if we want to go medical terms mm -hmm. so we go passion and then after passion i go i'll literally say what do you value what's important to you and no more than one word at a time, right? And some people are like, I value um, integrity. Okay, I value um, contact, communication. Okay, I value trust, I value this. And it's amazing when people go, have you ever worked for someone that doesn't value trust? And they're like, oh yeah. I'm like, so not everyone shares your same values here. And then I'll pull out a list of values as well. And that doesn't even need to come from the list. And I'll go, let's just list them all. All the things that are super important to you, right? Accomplishment is important, is a value to me, right? It's not how I define myself but completely now, but I used to. But accomplishment is important to me. I want to know at the end of the day, I actually moved the needle. That's important to me. There are some people who could care less about accomplishment. It's not a value to them. Maybe the value to them is... Um, flow right you know just moving with the flow of life okay great thank god there's multiple people with multiple values and right and so now people start to go okay there's things that are important to me and they're like i'm what's important to me is that i create the next cell phone no that's not a value that's a vehicle cell phone creator is a vehicle but if we go and we look at the value um the val why is it you want to create a cell phone well i want to be famous. Okay, so fame is a value to you. Okay, sure. I'm not going to take that away from you. Don't think it's a healthy value, but let's go there, you know, and now we have the values. And now I say, okay, ready? And I'll say, let's take your, now let's talk about life's purpose. And, and just for the sake of simplifying, my take on humanity as on human beings 
is we all have a life's purpose. All right, let's just go with that. Uh, there's other cultures that'll be like, that's stupid to talk about, whatever, but let's just go with, let's assume we all have a life's purpose. Now, a lot of people get tied up and they'll say, you know, what's your, what do you think your life's purpose is before we go into the, you know, academic part of the exercise more. And they'll say, um, to create the next cell phone. No, that's not a life's purpose. That's a vehicle. Well, to be a good dad or a mom. And I'll be like, um, nope, that's a vehicle of a life's purpose. Well, to raise my children. Well, nope, still, still a vehicle, right? Uh, you know? And so I go, and I'm like, I, I don't know. And so then we'll say, I'll say, look at that list of values that you listed and write the ones you would die for. Write the ones that are non-negotiable, that if anyone in your life were to breach that value, that relationship would be severely damaged and end the way you know it. And so people start going, oh. So like for me, I say, now, and we, we're going to shift words over time in our lives as we find better words or phrases. This is the academic model, right? We're, ideally, we're not designed to know our life's purpose, but if we can at least know what true north is, that's pretty important. And man, do I, do, do, you know, do my bow ties get set on fire when I realize like our education system from kindergarten is not teaching this kind of stuff. And I really do want to get into the education system because um, it failed me. The education system did fail me and that could be a different topic. But um, so values are one of those non-negotiables and people go like, well, I don't know, freedom, uh, which is mine. Right. And, and I don't mean freedom like America, freedom, the flag. I mean, if the government said, Michael, stop coaching because you're teaching people how to be too autonomous. If you keep coaching that, we will kill you. I'll be like, I better get my work out faster because they're going to kill me, right? So I, I asked the question for you, Tim, what value, what non-negotiable in your life would you die for? Meaning um, if, if, if someone said that I had to go without that, I'd be like, kill it, call it, call it a day. Yeah. And for me, it is the ability to allow people to be unique. Mm -hmm. Which, right. which is very similar freedom, but it, yeah. no, by no, by no coincidence, are we on this podcast together? Are you a coach? Am I a coach? Right. And so there's a similar theme there. And so, right. What would, what do you want to, let's give that a word. Let's give that a word right here. What is that? Is that, is that autonomy? Is that unique? In individuality. Individuality. Right. Yep. And so I imagine then other things fall like equality, right. And, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, then there's, you know, right now, gender equality movements really there. Well, that's individuality right there. Like, yeah. Hey, I don't get the, it's not that I don't get it. Right. She, he, they, I don't, Hey, what do you want to identify as? I am so going to show up for you the way you want me to identify you right? because that's your unique individuality. Okay. Right. Right. Rock on. Um, so, so that's a life's purpose. And so for, I'd imagine then for you, for me, we're very similar. Maybe there's a nuance in the difference of individuality versus, um, which makes sense for individuality with the bow ties, right? And stuff. Right. You know, like there it is. I'm too old for leather pants. <laughs> well, well, if you want to wear the leather pants, damn rock the weather, wet, wet, wet leather pants. But so the reason this is important, because here, let's bring this full circle all the way around is I, um, for me, if I'm having dinner with Lauren, my wife, or I'm out with a friend like I was last night, we social distance dinner outdoors in literally the middle of the street of New York while cars are zooming by, interesting times. Or if I'm on a podcast like this, or if I'm talking to a potential new employee, I am going to show up in all of my vehicles with this theme of uninhibited freedom to be self. And I have died for the cause. I have left in my early career, I have left jobs that challenged my non-negotiables because incongruency is exhausting. And what you risk reveals what you value, right? And I would leave a job even though that might have meant having to foreclose on my home, right? Yep. And, and a lot of people don't 
have the vocabulary yet of the North Star, what's most important to them. And so they're living in these, not always, right? But a lot of people live in these incongruent environments where the company they work for is dumping, you know, chemicals into the ocean, but their, but their life's purpose is, is equilibrium, right? Restoring balance. No. And so now we go to bed at night and we get depressed, right? The opposite. I just learned this the other day. The opposite of, what's the opposite of play? I would say work. No. When did we, right? So when did we as a culture say work should be work and play should be play? The opposite of play is depression. Interesting. Like, like I tried yeah. pushing back on that hard and no matter how hard I push back on it, I'm like, that's, I can't come up with another answer, right? Yeah. And because we, we've, we've decided, talk about labels. Who am I as a husband if I take away the word husband? Take away the work, take away the play. It, where, where, when did work become work and play become play, right? And that's a cultural thing. It is. That's a total cultural thing. And, and so now, to just tie this up in a pretty bow tie, they go, I go, I don't care. What, you wait tables. You be a hobo. You serve, you know, uh, you know be a gardener. That, that life's purpose, that thing you'll die for, apply to anything you do. And all of a sudden, this, this idea of I'm not my job. I'm my purpose. I'm my North Star. I'm that. Right. And that's why I say super hard to talk about this topic unless we sort of go through the academic model of it a little bit, because the life's purpose is just who I am. And I do look, Carl Jung believes you are born with an innate set of preferences in life. I don't know if you teach Myers Briggs. Not much. Not much. Right. And so Myers Briggs is based off of the work of Carl Gustav, Gustav, Carl, you know, Gustav Jung and um, uh, uh, Carl Gustav Jung. And, uh, and, and he said, you are, his theory is you were born with your left hand or your right hand. You're, le you're born with certain attributes. But let's not label ourselves with them because we can flex. But if we really look at it, like you look at kids, you have kids, right? I do. Two young adult daughters, 21 Two young adult daughters. and 26. But how about 26 and what? 21. And 21. I put you a bet. Again, I don't have, Lauren and I decided to have a child-free life, but I put you a bet. Their, what's important to them now showed up probably when they were five or six years old. Absolutely. And so if we go with that idea, if we do, even if it's wrong, even if what I'm saying is wrong, at least it's a direction, right? If we really have this purpose, and the purpose isn't to make the next cell phone, right? The purpose is to help people with individuality, to help people with, you know, being themselves, to help people solve problems so that they can show up as their genius. We're, we forget this. We're packed animals. We're social species. We're here to make the next person better. We're here to make the next version better. You're here. I, God, I hope your daughters are better than you, right? And I hope their daughters and sons are better than them, right? Because that's what we're designed to do. It's how we got here and being able to talk in a microphone is because someone was a better version of the version before them and they created this technology so we can now be better versions of us. And so this idea of what if I'm here to serve through my purpose? And if you don't believe in that, then I'm the wrong guy, right, for you. And that's okay because that's not my vehicle, you know? And so it's really fun during COVID. Fun might be the wrong word. Rewarding during COVID where people's identities have been really darkened, literally, uh, emotionally mm -hmm. darkened and literally darkened to have uh, groups of people, because I run this course called, uh, through the gratitude slam called Life on Your Terms. And that sounds super selfish, but when you actually look at it, it goes, how do, how do you serve your, how do you figure out, let me rephrase it. You don't create yourself in life. You uncreate yourself as we get older. We remove who we're not. And so Life on Your Terms is about, hey, who am I not? Oh, wow. I'm here for individualism. I can show up as a stranger to somebody in a restaurant and live my life's purpose. Money is just an energy. That's it. Money's an energy. 
And, and the reason I charge for coaching, because I would do it for free 24 hours a day, is you give me your energy, I'll give you mine. And so even people, like I have some coaches who, right, in, in corporate world, it's most, a lot of individuals wouldn't be able, to, wouldn't want to pay the money for the coaching. But there's some people who I go, you are very desirous to find, live your life's purpose and to feel congruency in your life. Hey, let's do, let's do 25. And, and I rarely do this, but let's do 25 bucks a session because in their life, that $25 is comparable to the amount of money that a corporate executive would pay me. And so to me, all I care about is energy for energy. Boom. You talk about that you, in your new program, you've made the price point. So just about anybody who wants to be part of it, can be part of it. So do you mind talking a little more? Yeah, I'll, I'll rewind the tape on that and I'll go to the first time we ever did it. Number one, life on your terms. Gratitude Slim has been around for, I'd have to look, probably eight years now. It started on Periscope, then Periscope got crushed by Facebook. So then I moved it over to Facebook and, and who knows where it'll go next. That's just where it gets host right now. Um, and so life on your terms came about. I've always wanted to do something like it. And I was like, oh, I'll do that three to five years from now. But what happened is, as COVID happened, I had super, what I would deem super successful friends come to me and say, I think I need to hire you because I come from entertainment. Um, I don't know what to do next. And I don't know if when the world wakes back up, the same financial compensation will be there on the other side that I'm making now. And I had so many people come to me with this question that I said, let me, I mean, it was so talk about throwing stuff against the wall and steam what sticks. I just said, hey, I don't have enough availability to, to coach you or even all the people coming. So I said, I'm doing this program. And that's where Life on Your Terms came from was to say, hey, I, you know, um, let's go through the path of, of what's life's purpose. What limiting beliefs do I have right now about my vehicles, about my identity, you know? Um, and um, so that's where it came from. And the first time we did it, because I had so many friends in entertainment, some super financially successful and others who were, you know, working their way up and paycheck to paycheck. So we just said, I don't know, let's do pay what you can. And, and I said, ticket price, I think it was 200 bucks. Pay what you can. And we had, I'm going to round it up. Let's say it was 40 people. It was 40 people on the first one. I think six people paid under $10. And the rest paid. It was, so, now, I don't know if it was just because of the first time. And the rest paid what was comparable to the, where they were in their life. I mean, I I had probably a quarter of people pay the full price. I'd say maybe half paid half of full price at like a hundred bucks and then a variation. And so I was like, that's cool. That that's is super cool. What a neat little unexpected social experiment. Now, um, now in these new cohorts, we still have, now we've just tiered it. So we want to make it possible. We have a, uh, a, a low $40, we call it COVID relief experience. And uh, we made 10 tickets for that. And if we need to, we'll expand it. But, you know, we just say, hey, there's 10 tickets available. If you really want this for yourself, please take it, which comes out to $10 a session, which pretty banging if you ask me, right? And, and then we have a $100 ticket, and then we have a $200 ticket, and they, everyone gets the same service, right? Just the $200 ticket, I, I now say, hey, if you want to do that, you'll get extra um, email coaching with me in between the sessions, you know, just to make their, th that the energy has something. But everyone gets the same education, and everyone knows that there's price points and tiers. Um, Hey man, if you want to do this, it's on you. It's that's your character. If you pay forty dollars and you are a, you want to and you know that two hundred dollars would be nothing for you. Hey, and I hope by the end, if that's the case, you go. Actually, this actually happened, Tim. This actually happened. Someone was halfway through the course and said, "Can I pay you more money? I underpaid." And I actually said. That's super sweet. Whatever experience you had that had you learn that, 
I'd much rather you take that energy, that money that you're willing to pay me to split the difference and buy a ticket for somebody else so that you pay it forward. That's amazing on both fronts, right? It, they it, had the recognition and you saw the value to, to offer to somebody else. Because that's all I care about. That's why I say energy for energy. Pay me a dollar. If that's, if that's a lot of money for you at the time, then it's a dollar, right? And so, um, you know, so we decided let's just simplify this, those three prices there. But, it, you know, and then we have other levels that people can take if they want to take in. Those we don't really have a, a price point on. But at that point, if I haven't demonstrated that I can add more value to their life in four 90-minute sessions, then I've not done my job. You know, and, and that's how I look at it is, is, you know what? Life's purpose. If I could leave the world a little bit better, yeah, hell. If I could leave the world a shit ton better than the way I that came into it, then, then great. And if that means some people paid me a dollar, some people paid me a dollar as long as they take it and they do something with it. And I mean, right now the program is fairly new and I'm not here to talk about the program itself, but it's this idea of, I, I can truly say I've never seen, I've never moved so much distance in a sh such a short period of time. And so I'm super proud of how the participants of the program decided to show up for themselves and, and take the work. And, and man, I just, yeah, how can I, how can I, I don't care where I do it, elementary school, corporate, uh, you know, um, homekeeper, you know, whatever. I, as long as people can lean into their life's purpose or, or understand that there's a North Star and apply and not tie themselves up and not take life so effing seriously, man. And I do it still to this day too. I take things seriously. And when I take things seriously, I've given Lauren full permission to go get over yourself. Actually, I didn't give her the permission. She says it on her own, but I gave her validation that she can continue doing that when I fall there. So when you do your retreats, what have you taken from them and worked into your coaching, into the, into your life on your terms program? Was there any aha moments? Yeah, I'm going to go with gut and answer two things. I, I, and I'm going to preface one. The reason I do the work I do is because, man, can I get to a dark place? Can I get sad? Can I get super down and not have any, any idea why I'm there? Right. Right. It, I, I mean, I, and I think, I think a lot of really good coaches coach because they know that feeling too, you know, talking about the metal music, it makes me feel alive. Right. Yeah. And, and to just, and, and so I need to preface what I'm about to say with that. So number one is, I'd say all the retreats taught me one thing. I like to move at a very fast speed. I'd say right now, if we were to have recorded this podcast five years ago, my speed would have been easily doubled, possibly tripled in the way I speak. Um, this to me is still uncomfortable talking at this speed because it's not the cadence I spent the first 40 years, 35 years, whatever of my life in. So I, this takes a lot of conscious energy. And I'd like to think it doesn't sound slow to you, does it? No. No. But to me, this is super slow. To me, this is, it's like double, and I'm not a big espresso drinker. I'm a teacher here, right? But the one time I had espresso, the world couldn't move fast enough for me. Like me speaking like this, I just, my inside just wants to be like, hurry up, just get the point out. But I've, so, so the aha moment of doing the trips was, dude, don't go any faster than your guardian angel can fly. Slow the F down. You will accomplish more by slowing down than trying to speed up. And so I, I'm speaking at this speed now, even though it's out of my natural case, it's more comfortable for me now, right? Right. Way more comfortable, but, but the voice in my head is like, dude, you're not speaking fast enough. Like this would be the speed that I probably normally would have spoken at five years ago. I would have been totally here talking like this and, and still totally in my zone, but I'd be moving a little faster than, than, than the nature allows me to, right? And, and so I would make a lot of mistakes and I wouldn't be present. I would be thinking about what I'm going to say next. And what's super fun about talking to you, Tim, as a coach is I feel like we're totally present. 
you know, during this. Yeah. Absolutely. Granted, I'm doing most of the talking, but but I think you're asking me the question. So, uh, so um, number one was uh, slow down, man. Slow down, everyone. Like we don't, we accomplish more the slower we go. It's it's. I can't explain it. I can say I'm doing more work in my life. This is going to sound like a total conundrum. I'm probably doing, accomplishing more in my life in a given day now than I was 10 years ago in a year. And yet I still have more free time and more bandwidth and margin than I've ever had before. And all of that started when I started doing my solo retreats and slowing the f down it's a total conundrum if i say it to someone who's a workaholic they'll never believe it until until they either want the change or they crash and burn i i and maybe there's someone in between that doesn't hear that message who gets it or does hear the message that gets it but i think you either need to have enough pain in your life that you want to hear it or you have had to crash and burn which is more pain i i just don't know how to uh, you know i'm not here to teach people who are the workaholic i'm here to teach people who are the workaholic and they felt the pain and they want to stop i i'm not here to point out because who am i to say that they're wrong maybe that style works for them so that's the first thing i got out of it and the second thing i got out of it was on that january cruise because it was the first time i did the retreat in an isolated environment where i didn't even have cell service and what i learned was because i made a challenge to myself i'm not gonna think about work until halfway through, which I've always done. But I'm yeah. truly just going to go see the shows, go eat the food. As I'm eating the food, I'm going to taste it. So it was just a new challenge. The challenge was, actually, the challenge was to be present. Yeah. And I experienced something that, oh, it sounds like I'm exaggerating when I say I've never experienced it before. I don't remember a time ever experiencing it. There was a time, I remember the exact moment, where I was just walking through the halls and I felt something. I'm experiencing it now, reliving it. This is fun. It's the first time I've ever experienced it again. So thank you for giving me that platform or that opportunity in that space. Um, and I started to well up. My eyes start to well up and I realized I'm happy. Yeah. That's, yeah. You, you have to give yourself the space. Yeah. You can't feel happiness in the future and you can't feel happiness in the past. And I had to get on an airplane and get on a cruise and say, my challenge to myself is just to feel the wind for a week and to taste the mediocre buffet food for a week, you know, and right. And just to, that was it. I said, my purpose right now, how can I teach it if I can't be present? And I had several moments during the cruise where I was like, I feel happy. And, and, and man, and since then, and that was just January, by the way, right? Right. And, and since then, I can emulate that. Even when I'm sad, I can emulate it. Because I sit in the present, I feel the sadness, and out of the sadness, the clouds clear. And if I'm just present with the sadness and not try to move past it faster or whatever, yeah, that's it. Dude, this was super fun. This was fun. So last question. What didn't I ask you that I should have? You asked some great questions. Um, what did you ask me that you should have? Hmm. Sitting on this one for one second. I know this sounds crazy and I'm reverse engineering it because we went through this really fun little rabbit hole. My question, because you know what? It comes back to, this is me not deflecting. This is me living in alignment with who I am. My question for you is, 
what do you need now? You know, I, I went on the journey myself. You know, I made the joke earlier about tanking like a rock star, right? I took a job, did 10 years of work in 16 months, burnout, gave up everything, right? And ironically, the metalhead does meditation and yoga. And my yoga practice is actually five years old, five years and two days ago. My meditation practice is about two years old, right? And the truth is, is when I looked at what I was doing, right, in that individuality, and I will, t I will use academic term as well, I grew up with an outsider's view, right? I was the kid whose dad had a college degree and had a white collar job when all the steel mills were shutting down in Pittsburgh, PA, right? My parents took the trip to New York every year to go to the theater, right? Mm -hmm. I grew up going to the touring productions, to the symphony, and then going to a college football game. So I had a very bizarre, I thought everybody went to Shakespeare Festival followed by a basketball <laughs> game, right? I just thought that was normal. So I always had that outsider's view. And, and so part of what drove me to do what I'm doing today was I looked at people and when you say sales coach, everybody thinks glad handing type A, overachiever, super driven. And I look, I'm analytical. I'm not, I'm not an introvert, but to use musician terms, I was the lead guitarist. I never wanted to be the lead singer, right? <laughs> I wanted to be able to hide behind six strings and some noise um, kind of guy. And I was, I'm a good number two guy in a corporate environment. I am not a good number one guy because I'm not that character. And I looked at it and I said, there's a lot of salespeople in the world that aren't being successful and a lot of business people in the world that aren't being successful because they're trying to force themselves into a mold. So when you talk about what I need, what I need is I find joy, right? And I have those dark spaces too. Mm -hmm. I find joy when I find that person that has all the talent and has all the ability in the world and just doesn't know it. And that's what feeds me. Well, that's like, right, Yoda to Luke Skywalker. You like to be Yoda. Yeah. I yeah. love being, I'm not even a Star Wars guy, but I love the idea of, I don't want to be the, here. And I'm using such, right, I got to give credit where credit's due. I learned that analogy um, from Donald Miller, who uh, wrote the book Story Brand, I believe it's called. But he says, right, you know, our jobs is, you know, basically, but, but, but for me, it's, it's not what he says. Now it's me interpreting his, his work. But it's like, I don't want to be the hero. I want to be Yoda. Yeah. And I and now now I want to be Yoda to as many people as I can um, because I want to make a lot of Luke Skywalkers and and I've always I I've just been lucky that from an early age I can say I just want to help people be extraordinary in their lives I've always known that and so it sounds like you're there too right you like being the guide mm -hmm. for the hero so yeah, I love I that. So, so you said, so the question is, what do you need? So you said you need to be the guide. That's yeah. what you need. That's what feeds me. Yeah. Well, in a, in a way, or not in a way, as the podcast host asking me the questions, you're being the guide. You're saying, here's the question. How do I get this answer out of you? It's already in you, Luke Skywalker, you know, and, and I bring it out. So even though I want to be a guide, you're giving me the space to be my own hero and talk about, you know, a hero for myself. And I get to take that and wrap it back in a bow and go be a guide for somebody else, you know, but, but I love that your need is to be the guide. Well, thank you. Cool. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for spending oh, the time. Thank you, my friend. Again, a sincere thank you to Michael for being here today, for sharing his time, sharing his positivity with us, and really helping us make a difference. It's amazing what he's done, creating programs that allow people at every price point to participate and benefit from them, as well as free. And I love his faith in humanity on the pay what you can and the story about folks coming back. Um, with that... Be sure, if you haven't already done so, go check him out on Facebook in the Gratitude Slam. You can find him at thelegacyofyou.com. Of course, all the links are in the show notes. If you're not a subscriber to our show, please hit subscribe on your favorite podcast service. You can always find me at timkubiak.com. And like always, right at the top, 
I'm willing to give anyone an hour of my time for that initial conversation. If you're having sales or transition or leadership problems, it's not a pitch call. It really is just a conversation. And the more detail you give me when you go in and book it, the better the call will be. And at the end, we figure out whether we should continue to work together. But if not, that's okay. I'm happy to help you for an hour. So thanks for listening. We'll talk to you all again next week. Enjoy running your business. Enjoy living your life. And thanks for being here.